I'm sure you'll agree with me that finding a good, safe parking place is generally a problem. And no, I'm not talking about finding a spot in Karol Bagh. That's next to impossible. And neither am I hinting at this highly rated Tamil movie, which I found it to be a bit okayish. So it's not a location, it's not a movie, but what I'm referring to is the parking of money, which is a question I'm being asked more often now. And that's understandable with the markets being a bit high, volatile, and definitely a bit uncertain with the elections coming up, with interest rates likely to go down, but we don't know by when, and God knows which war is brimming in which part of the world. In fact, I know a few people who are not actively investing, at least not putting in additional capital, so they're being safe rather than being sorry, and if you're one of them, then you'll find this video very useful, wherein I've compiled a list of parking lots, waiting areas for you and your money. I should mention none of it is rocket science and whenever you feel you're out of options on where to keep your money during uncertain times, you'll always have this list to refer to and hopefully it will help you organize your thoughts. Let's begin. The first and foremost option for you to consider is the good old bank fixed deposit and with many banks offering a high interest rate on them, in my opinion, this is the most optimal way of parking one's money for a short period of let's say 6 to 12 months. So in terms of advantages, your money is pretty safe, it's liquid as you can always break a deposit and you get a fixed interest on it but yes, this interest amount is taxable as per your marginal tax rate. Another option which I see many senior citizens take up are corporate fixed deposits. So much like a bank FD, these deposits are offered by NBFCs like Bajaj Finance and by housing loan companies like LIC Housing on an ongoing basis, but it also includes deposits offered by public sector undertakings like NHAI, NTPC, etc. that can also be bought from the secondary market using your brokerage account. While these deposits offer slightly better rates as compared to a bank FD, do ensure the paper you invest in is AAA rated and that you have a clear understanding of the tenure, the yield and the taxation involved. Another alternative in case you want to explore it are the post office time deposits which can be open for a minimum of one year, are super secure as these are guaranteed by the government of India and the interest rates offered are somewhere close to what a bank offers. So there are subtle variations in these three options, but if I have to choose and considering this is a 6, 9, 12 month parking of money, then I for one would prefer the bank wala option. A second option and an absolute no brainer is to park money in your bank savings account. This money is super liquid and one can access these funds at a very short notice. Section 80 TTA of the Income Tax Act keeps an interest of up to 10,000 rupees free from taxation and thanks to growing competition, many banks are upping their interest rates with some institutions, especially the smaller private banks and also small finance banks offering 7%, even 8% on specific balanced years. So there is liquidity, there is safety, there are returns. And given the simplistic nature of the product, I think this would definitely appeal to everyone, including novice investors, freelancers, or self-employed people like myself, and of course, senior citizens who are generally offered a little extra on these accounts. Next up are debt mutual funds. And because they come in different shapes and sizes, figuring out which one works best can always be a tricky one. But in my view, the selection criteria comes down to just two important variables. That is, number one, there's the safety. And as an instrument, liquid funds, overnight funds, money market funds, and of course, government bonds have a lower credit risk and therefore a higher safety as compared to, say, a credit risk that invests in A or lower than A rated papers. And secondly, there is the interest rate sensitivity with lower duration funds like liquid and ultra short term schemes being less affected by changes in RBI's repo rates as compared to the long duration funds. In fact, I did a recent video on this that even explains the theoretical basis of making a 15% return on a 10 year paper if the repo rates were to go down by 0.75%. Now, unless you really want to play tactically, I think short duration schemes like money market and ultra short duration funds are sufficient if you want to park your money for the next six to 12 months. But having said this, the taxation benefit one used to receive on debt funds on the long term capital gains part is no longer there thanks or rather no thanks to our finance minister who changed the rules from April of last year. And I have a video on that as well, where I invited four experts to my studio to talk about it. 
And when things like taxes, wars, elections, a pandemic can create so much uncertainty around our investing, imagine how demanding it will be for your family in case you aren't around for them. It's exactly why one should seriously consider term insurance and if you've been putting it aside because of indecision or perhaps because there are too many variables to consider, the one platform I can certainly vouch for is Clarify Life, an initiative of HDFC Life which makes planning for a term insurance policy a lot easier, a lot more accurate and definitely a lot lot more personalized. In fact, Clarify Life has a lot to offer, but specifically look out for their term guide, which is a short and interactive DIY guide that helps you understand what you should buy and more importantly, what you shouldn't do. The term guide will help you decide on till when you should stay covered, how much life cover to opt for, what add-on benefits to have in your policy, for how long should you be paying the premium, and how best can the claim amount be paid out to your family. These are all important decisions, something I've seen hundreds of people miss out on. And once you've gone through the workflow, Clarify Life will also provide you with a detailed customized report together with some tips, hacks, do's and do nots. You can then approach any life insurance company or an insurance advisor to get your term insurance right. The term guide is 100% free. Clarify Life will not sell you any insurance. You get absolutely unbiased advice. And as always, the link to this tool, which you should definitely try out, is available in this video's description. Option four, and a rather uncommon one, is to use your NPS tier two account to keep some money aside. So while the taxation is similar, at least I read it somewhere that the NPS subscriber has to pay tax on the returns earned as per the marginal tax rate, which puts it on par with taxes charged on an FD or debt mutual fund. But here is where the NPS tier 2 account scores above these traditional options. So firstly, there is no lock-in like what an FD has and one can freely park money for a week, a month, six months or for the next 10 years. Secondly, no exit load is charged when withdrawing the money. There is no minimum balance to be maintained. The expense ratios are super low with 0.09% of the AUM being the maximum allowable charge. And operationally, the withdrawals are credited within three working days. But having said this, the big consideration is the scheme you are getting into. And as I explained it in the earlier section, always look for the safety and the interest rate sensitivity part of it. For example, I extracted this worksheet from SBI pension funds and I'm specifically looking at the tier 2 class C section that is the corporate bonds category. So with respect to safety, one can see the fund has 82% of its assets in AAA rated instruments, 10% is in AA papers and the remaining money is in money market instruments which tells me that this fund's credit profile is pretty safe. Now, from an interest perspective, the modified duration of the scheme is 4.67, which means indicatively if the RBI repo rate were to go up or down by say half a percent, then the returns from the scheme over the next one year would be in the 5.5% to 10.2% range, although I think the 10.2% scenario is the one that's more likely to happen. Anyways, my point is always look out for safety and interest rate sensitivity whenever you are exploring a pure play debt fund or when investing money in your NPS accounts, class C or class G schemes. The next parking lot and something many of you must have heard of are arbitrage funds. Simply said, an arbitrage fund is an equity mutual fund that aims to exploit the price differences in the cash and futures market. For example, let's say a share of Reliance Industries is available at 3000 rupees in the cash market and 3050 rupees in the futures market. So at the beginning of the month, we'll buy one share of Reliance from the cash market and simultaneously sell it in the higher price futures market. Now on the last day of FNO expiry, the cash market and the futures market generally converge. And that's also the time we, the investor, has to reverse one's position, that is we'll have to sell in the cash market and buy from the futures market. This method is called cash and carry arbitrage. And the beauty of this is that irrespective of whether the price of reliance goes up or goes down, or it stays where it is, the arbitrage fund can always make money from these mispricings. In fact, an arbitrage fund is perhaps the only mutual fund category where volatility works to the investor's advantage. And when spreads are high, these funds have historically offered 8 to 9% returns. And when the spreads narrow, the returns are mostly in the 4 to 5% range. So while the fund's performance depends on demand, volatility and spreads, arbitrage funds are generally considered to be low risk. They are perfectly suitable for a 9 to 12 month parking of funds and are relatively tax efficient as capital gains from arbitrage funds are taxed on an equity basis. Alright, so we are at number 6 and while the earlier ones were debt based, 
or rather they were non-equity informant function, we now look for parking spaces which have a little bit of equity, making them a little volatile, a little riskier as compared to earlier options. The first of such options are the conservative hybrid funds, which as per regulations need to have anywhere from 75 to 90% of their assets invested in debt, while the rest 10 to 25% can be invested in equities. So barring exceptions like 2018, these funds tend to deliver anywhere from 6 to 11% in returns. But remember the taxation on these are debt oriented, that is capital gains are taxed as per the investor's marginal tax rate, which does not suit investors in the 30% bracket. And this is the reason why I'm not a big fan of this category for parking short term money and comparatively would instead prefer using a fixed deposit. The next short term parking option, especially for investors, who don't want their additional capital to be devoid of equity but merely want to reduce their exposure are the equity savings funds. This hybrid investment strategy uses a mix of equity, debt and arbitrage in equal proportions which means there is decent downside protection. These funds can generate inflation beating returns and the taxation is equity oriented which means STCG is taxed at 15% and LTCG at 10%. But yes, there are market risks that need to be factored. However, to draw a comparison with conservative hybrid funds, these equity saving funds have a higher range with returns vacillating from 4 to 15 percent. In my opinion, it's more of a probability game. So if the uncertainty is like 50-50, that is a 50 percent chance that the market might fall and a 50 percent chance that it might rise, then in that case, an equity savings funds can definitely be looked at. And finally, a very popular category amongst hybrid mutual funds are the dynamic asset allocation funds or balance advantage funds as they are popularly known. These instruments invest in a mix of equity and debt instruments and the core USP here is the fund's ability to adjust their portfolio allocation between equity and debt based on market valuations. So essentially when the markets are undervalued, then the strategy increases its exposure to equity and when the valuations are high, the preference shifts towards debt. This way, these balance advantage funds aim to provide an optimal return while taking acceptable risk in line with the fund management team's understanding of valuations, which it does using methods like the P ratio, the price to book multiple, etc. Now, this part is important because what this means is that every fund house has its own way of evaluating the markets and there can be big variations in the proportion of equity and debt on a per scheme basis. This affects the taxation as well and if the balance advantage fund can keep its equity proportion to over 65% that most of the funds do keep then the capital gain taxation is done on an equity basis or else it will happen on a non-equity setup. In addition to this, the range of returns offered by a BAF is pretty sharp, sharper than what a conservative hybrid or an equity savings fund tends to offer. And when I compare the three, and in my opinion, the use of an equity savings fund for parking short term money is more preferable. But yes, if you are a moderately risk tolerant or intolerant individual, then a balance advantage fund is something you can explore for your long term parking of money of say three to five years. So these eight options I've listed here are the most standard of instruments that one can explore when there is a need to park some money aside, especially when there is uncertainty in the markets. I mean, yes, there are other complex options like using futures options or even relatively stable assets like REITs and INVITs. But in my view, retail investors like you and me don't need to go that path. And the products we've seen here are more than enough to do the job. A related and often asked question is on how to deploy this money that has been parked aside after there is clarity on the direction of the markets and I for one have always advocated the use of instruments like the SIP, the Systematic Investment Plan and the STP, the Systematic Transfer Plan to move money from the parking lot and back into equity schemes. For instance, in the case of savings accounts and fixed deposits, a simple SIP can do the job wherein money goes from the bank account into the fund. But when using funds like debt, arbitrage or any of the three hybrid schemes we have discussed, then a good way of easing into equities is via an STP where the source money goes in a debt or hybrid fund and the target is of course a solid pure equity fund. In fact, I should add this, for a decently long time, my notion of an STP was to put the money first in a debt fund or an arbitrage fund and then to move it to an equity fund. However, I'm getting more comfortable doing the same STP from an equity savings fund into a pure equity fund because firstly, about 65% of the equity savings fund is non-equity, which is good. And secondly, it offers equity taxation on capital gain, which would be able to give me a better post-tax return, even if the equity markets remain a bit volatile. 
So do as you wish, but try not to overcomplicate matters. And if you have any other way of parking your monies in the short run, then do let me know in the comment section below. Once again, thank you for your time. Do like this video. Do subscribe to my newsletter and I'll see you next week. Until then. Thank you.